Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today I've got a benchmark video for you guys and in a way it's a bit of a follow up to last week's discussion about quad core CPUs for gaming in late 2017. It's not a direct follow up but there will be a few areas of overlap. The focus here is on bottlenecking whether that be CPU or GPU bottlenecking and I'll be checking out a range of very different games so some will be old, some will be new, some will be CPU bound and others will be GPU bound. For the benchmarks, I have grabbed a few different CPUs and this isn't an AMD versus Intel comparison. So I'm not picking, you know, int I'm not matching up Intel CPUs with AMD CPUs. So you're not gonna see like an R5 1600 versus 7700K battle here. We've done plenty of that. So it's just a few random CPUs of different price categories. Doesn't matter which side of the fence they're on. And we're comparing them with a range of graphics cards. So like the GeForce GTX 1060, 1070 and 1080 at 1080p. And this should give you a pretty good idea of what kind of CPU and GPU pairing makes sense for your particular budget and the games you plan on playing. I'd also show you just how much, uh, say, lower end CPUs like the G4560 and Ryzen 3 1200 are limiting the performance of higher end GPUs such as the GTX 1070 and 1080. Should you be crazy enough to pair a $100 CPU with a $400 plus GPU, you flipping loonies, then I guess us reviewers Kind of do that all the time, don't we? Anyway, towards the end of the benchmarks, we'll also check out some overclocking results as well, so that should be pretty cool. So with that, let's jump into the benchmarks. First up, we have Battlefield 1, and here you can see using something like the GTX 1060, there is no difference in performance between the various CPUs. The G4560 matches the Core i7-7700K with a minimum of 71 FPS and an average of 80 FPS. Granted, you might see a larger variance when in the heat of a 64-player battle, but sadly, that's just not possible to accurately benchmark. Anyway, I personally have found the G4560 and GTX 1060 combo acceptable for multiplayer action. You certainly can't complain with the price. Upgrading to the GTX 1070, we start to see a real separation between the various CPUs tested. The 7700K is now up to 28% faster than the G4560. That said, the Ryzen and Core i5-7400 CPUs still look quite good. However, once we move to the GeForce GTX 1080, things start to change quite a lot. Now the 7700K offers around 50% more performance than the G4560, and it's even 20% faster than the Core i5-7400. So as expected with higher end GPUs, you really need a powerful CPU to take full advantage. Moving on, we have the F1 2016 results. I'm using the older 2016 version as F1 2017 came out after I gathered most of these results when I was testing the Ryzen 3 CPUs. Anyway, some interesting results nonetheless. Even though we see the same 71 FPS average frame rate with most of the CPUs tested using the GTX 1060, there is a small difference in the 1% low results. Then things change massively once we step up to the GTX 1070. Here the G4560 starts to fall quite far behind, especially when looking at the 1% low result. Here it was 33% slow with just 55 FPS when compared to the 7700K's 83 FPS. That said, the Ryzen and Core i5 processors do hang in there quite well with the 1070. However, once we step up to the GTX 1080, the 7700K is fully unleashed and now it can be seen pulling miles ahead of the Core i5-7400 and Ryzen 5 1400. The 7700K was almost 80% faster than the G4560 as well in what was a true display of dominance. Right, so Battlefield 1 and F1 2016 are very CPU intensive titles that utilize multi-core CPUs very well. Far Cry Primal, on the other hand, isn't particularly demanding on the CPU and it's certainly one of the more GPU bound titles we'll be testing with. That being the case, we unsurprisingly see no real difference in performance with the GeForce GTX 1060 between the five CPUs tested. Moving to the GTX 1070, we find that the Core i5 and Core i7 CPUs are able to deliver noticeably better 1% low results. Of course, you can still overclock the Ryzen CPUs, and we'll look at that a bit later on. Then with the GTX 1080, we see much the same performance on all processors tested with the exception of the 7700K, while the G4560, Core i5 and Ryzen CPUs all limit the GTX 1080 to 1070-like performance. Meanwhile, the 7700K boosts the average frame rate by 32%, making it 41% faster than the G4560. I don't suspect anyone would pair a G4560 with a GTX 1080, but if you did, this is why it would be a bad idea. With Total War Warhammer, we return to an extremely CPU demanding title, and as such, even the GTX 1060 shows up the G4560 shortcomings, 
as this lower clocked dual core does start to fall behind. If we jump up to the GTX 1080, we find the Ryzen 3 and Ryzen 5 CPUs aren't really able to increase performance over what was seen with the GTX 1070. It is worth mentioning that we've discovered that this is due to the way Nvidia's drivers handle the DirectX 12 API on their Pascal based GPUs. Anyway, that's not the focus of this video. Even if we look at the Core i5 and Core i7 processors with the GTX 1070, there is now quite a bit of separation. This is accentuated with the GTX 1080, and now the 7700K is almost 30% faster than the Core i5-7400. Meanwhile, it's 71% faster than the G4560. Overwatch is yet another CPU intensive title that takes advantage of core heavy CPUs, at least as well as any DirectX 11 title does. Here we see that with the GTX 1060, all five CPU configurations provide similar results. However, once again, moving to the GTX 1070 starts to mix things up a bit, though it is mostly the G4560 that's lagging behind. The G4560 finds its limits with the GTX 1070, and this can be seen when moving to the 1080 virtually no increase in frame rate is seen. Meanwhile, the 7700K is now 24% faster with the 1080, and that means it's 53% faster than the G4560. So yet again, we see a clear and very large example of CPU bottlenecking. The Witcher 3 is one of the first games to really make good use of quad-core CPUs, but even so, the hyper-threading enabled G4560 does very well in this title. Overall, we do appear to be primarily GPU limited here, and even with a GTX 1080 installed, the 77RK isn't able to pull away from the Core i5 and Ryzen processors. Moving on, we have some Rainbow Six Siege results, and here the 77RK is able to squeeze a little more out of the 1060, though the 1% low figure is much the same. A similar situation is seen with the GTX 1070, and then finally, with the GTX 1080 installed, the 77RK is now significantly faster, at least when comparing the average frame rate. World of Tanks is all about that single thread performance, so higher clock speeds rule here, and this is why the Ryzen 3 1300X is able to outpace the Ryzen 5 1400. The 7700K at its high out of the box operating frequency also gives an advantage here, though with something like a GTX 1060 you won't see any real difference. As we move to the GTX 1070, the Core i5 and Core i7 CPUs pull ahead and they're now offering around 10% more frames than the R3 1300X. Then with the GTX 1080 installed, the 7700K races ahead and is now 19% faster than the Core i5-7400 and almost 30% faster than the G4560. Like World of Tanks, Counter-Strike Global Offensive doesn't utilize multi-core CPUs very well, and the 7700K's superior IPC performance and higher operating frequencies do give it a significant advantage in this title. Even with a GTX 1060 install, we see a rather large difference in performance between the Core i5 and Core i7 CPUs when compared to the Pentium and Ryzen CPUs. Then once we get up to the GTX 1070 and 1080 graphics cards, the CPU bottlenecking is quite extreme with most of the CPUs tested. Before wrapping things up, let's see how the Ryzen 3 and Ryzen 5 CPUs compare to the 7700K once overclocked. Uh, to be clear, we're not overclocking the 7700K, just the Ryzen CPUs. The 1300X has been replaced with an overclocked R3 1200, and that's been clocked at 4 GHz, while the Core i5-7400 has been replaced with the old Sandy Bridge Core i5-2500K, which has been clocked at a very mild 4.4 GHz. The Ryzen 5 1400 has now also been overclocked to 4 GHz, while the 7700K, as I said, has been left untouched, and of course, so too has the locked Pentium G4560. So first, looking at Battlefield 1, we see that we are again GPU limited with the GTX 1060, but as we move to the GTX 1070, the midfield looks a bit more competitive. That said, even with the overclock, the Ryzen CPUs are still slower than what we saw previously with the Core i5-7400, at least in this particular title. That said, with the GTX 1080 installed, the Ryzen CPUs now somehow come back and pull ahead of where the i5-7400 was, and they're also now not a great deal slower than the 7700K, so that's interesting. The R5-1400, for example, is now just 10% slower, which isn't bad given its price. Here we see that when testing with Overwatch, that overclocking the Ryzen 5 1400 really helped it close the gap on the 7700K with the GTX 1070. The quad-core Ryzen 3 still struggles, and in fact, the overclocked R3 1200 is no faster than what we saw with the stock R3 1300X, and this is down to the fact that XFR is disabled once we overclock. 
However, once again, we see that with the GTX 10A, the Ryzen CPUs actually do better, which is, again, quite surprising, at least when compared to what we saw with the stock figures previously. The R3 1200 at 4 GHz is now 6% faster than the R3 1300X when comparing the 1% low result. Even so, these CPUs are clearly limiting the GTX 1080's performance, as the 7700K was able to extract noticeably more frames. The last game that I'm going to look at with these overclocked results is World of Tanks, and here the overclocked Ryzen CPUs are able to catch up, though they aren't able to match the stock 7700K. Still, as expected, overclocking the Ryzen 3 and 5 CPUs to 4GHz does reduce the bottleneck, but even so, in these older titles, they still struggle to get the most out of even the GTX 1070. So, how bad is bottlenecking in 2017, I hear you ask? Or was that... that's what the video was asking. Anyway, well... That all depends on how bad you are at pairing appropriate hardware. Any experienced system builder will tell you it's important to build a balanced system, especially if you want to receive the maximum bang for your buck. Trying to future-proof, though, that's generally just a waste of money. You're best off looking at what hardware uh, combos deliver the best results right now and just go from there. For example, if you're addicted to Overwatch, and this is the game that you'll be playing primarily for the foreseeable, but you can only afford a GeForce GTX 1070, for example, and I say only because it is a $400 GPU and not the $700 GTX 1080 Ti, but yes, I get that it is still a very expensive GPU. Anyway, if the GTX 1070 is as good as it's possibly going to get for you, spending over $300 on the 7700K might not be a smart choice when the $160 Ryzen 5 1400 delivers a very similar experience for a fraction of the price for those playing Overwatch, though this also appears to be true for most other titles as well. Once overclocked, they are both able to get the most out of the GTX 1070 in this CPU-intensive title. But what about the future, I hear you say? We saw that even when overclocked, the R5 1400 was still 10% slower than the 7700K with the GTX 1080, and that margin will no doubt grow with the 1080 Ti and faster GPUs in the future. I guess I'd first question how many of you stretching your budget for something like a GTX 1070 now are going to turn around and upgrade the GPU within a 24-month period. I'd say almost none of you will do that. So in three to four years when you finally upgrade the GTX 1070, it's then that I'd evaluate where the Ryzen 5 1400's at and potentially the AM4 platform for that matter. It's likely going to make much more sense to take the money you save now and put that towards an upgrade in a few years time rather than future proof now, which will no doubt just result in more wasted money. Right now, the 7700K is the cheapest it's ever been as the 8700K is due out next week. That aside though, at $310 plus at least $110 for a budget Z270 board and say $30 for a cooler, you've invested at least $450. A smarter option right now might be to buy the Ryzen 5 1400 for example. It costs $160, put that on a B350 motherboard for $70 and you've got about a $230 combo there. That's almost half the price of what you would have spent on the 7700K system. And of course, as we've just seen, you will get a very similar experience with the GTX 1070. Then, as I said, in two to three years, you can look at spending the other half of the money you just saved on another $230-ish CPU and motherboard combo. And that is assuming you can't reuse the AM4 motherboard for a Zen 2 CPU, for example. And I'm sure there's similar scenarios you could make with an Intel processor, certainly, as I said, after next week. I'm just giving this example now because it's a valid example that exists right now. And on that note, of course, all of this will need to be re-evaluated shortly when we get the 8th generation core CPUs, and of course we'll be taking an in-depth look at that very soon. As for the argument that quad cores shouldn't be used for gaming anymore, and that is the 4-core, four 4-threaded four quad cores, well you can see why that's a bit silly. There's nothing wrong with the Ryzen 3 series or Intel's uh, dual cores with hyper-threading enabled for that matter, if paired with a sensible GPU, of course, something like the GTX 1060, as we just saw. Those buying a $400 GTX 1070 or maybe a $500 plus GTX 1080 probably aren't looking at spending $100 on their CPU. So if it's those kind of users that are saying quad cores are no good for gaming, well, they probably don't understand the budgets of guys buying $100 CPUs. Anyway... The Ryzen 3 series, along with the Intel Pentium G4560, or really any of the KB Lake and Skylake uh, dual cores that have hyper-threading enabled, those CPUs are targeted at budget shoppers, 
budget gamers. And at the high end or the top of any budget gamers wish list, you'll find something like a GTX 1060 or you know, the RX 580 if they were affordable at the moment. Anyway, GTX 1060 type performance, not a GTX 1080. And for the vast majority of games, something like you know these affordable CPUs, whether it be the R3 1200 or a G4560, they're really indistinguishable from something like the 7700K when using a GTX 1060. And we also saw, because the R3 1200 does, it's an unlocked part, you can overclock it. And we found once overclocked, it does hang in there pretty well with something like a GTX 1070. So there is a bit of future-proofing uh, available there. Well, that's going to do it for this one. I hope that helps those of you trying to work out what kind of CPU and GPU pairing will suit your budget and needs best. Um, yeah, like I said, that pretty much does it for this one. I don't have anything else to say on the subject. Um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the video. Like it. Subscribe if you haven't already. Those are good things to do. Um, maybe go back and watch episode four of Upgrade My PC, please. That was a really cool episode. If you vote, you can win a... No, actually... Yeah, voting's closed by now. It closed yesterday afternoon, so if you haven't voted, you probably missed out on a really sweet prize. But in two days' time, uh, what is it, Saturday? A couple of days' time, there'll be another episode, and you better vote and win a really cool prize, and that's global. So, yeah, we've had a couple of winners around the world already, and, yeah. So, I suppose you, in the meantime, I don't really know what you can do with your time. Uh, maybe go back and watch a really long unboxing video or something. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm your host, Steve. Uh, I'll catch you guys next time. <sighs> yeah, I'll go with that. That was pretty smooth, that outro.